you're an actor and a writer, and you're best known for your role as Keith Bishop in The Office. Yep. You've played numerous comedy parts across film and television, including Lisa Britton and Miranda, and you've worked alongside some of Britain's just massive stars. So Yeah, welcome. I'm getting pretty lucky, yeah. Yeah, thank you for joining us. That's all right. Um, so, what is life like after The Office? I have to ask. It's, you know, it's it's been it's coming up for twenty years, isn't it? Since two thousand and one. So um... it's more it's more difficult to to remember what life was like before it, really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, it's funny, really, because it's um, it, it kind of it didn't it wasn't one of those overnight smashes. So it it kind of it wasn't like one like going on some of these shows now, like these reality shows where one minute. No one knows who you are, and then the next, suddenly everyone knows. It was a real gradual process over, I reckon, about two or three years. So there was never sort of a moment where it's like, oh, my life has changed. It was always kind of, I mean, I was sort of working, even after we kind of were doing series two, I was still had like a day job in a, uh, really? as a manager in a call center for a charity, yeah, for a, uh, sorry, for a market research company. Um, so the, then, the, then I remember there I was like training people there, and there was that there was, it started to trickle through where people would come in, and they'd go, oh, that that guy who's training us, he's uh, he looks familiar, and so that was very gradual as well. Um, so it wasn't until uh, maybe it was between the series two and the Christmas specials I think, where I sort of became full time, you know, creative person rather than the kind of the day job to, to keep me going. Yeah. And of course, it's gone on to be like just incredible. Like it's, it's done in pretty much every single language. Um, yeah, it's, it's massive. Yes, yeah, it's, it's strange that it kind of, uh, it, it, it doesn't sort of, at the moment, it doesn't seem to sort of be going away. It's, um, it's still what people want to talk about. It's still what people remember. And the, the example I use is there was a time probably about it was just after I'd done Little Britain, where I would say 80% of the times I was getting recognised was for Little Britain, and maybe 20% The Office. Okay. And then over, and then after about three or four years, that went down and down. And now, never ever get recognised for Little Britain. It's back to The Office, even though you know The Office was a few years before. So it's strange how things come and go in people's consciousness, but. The office is still kind of remembered. It's still kind of quite, quite fresh in people's minds for some weird reason. It does feel like it was not yesterday, but it doesn't feel like it was that long ago. Yeah, I know. It's it's, and I, it's weird because I do now. Um, I host quizzes all over the country, like based on the office. Huh. I started that about two years ago, and they get you know they get packed out with people who know everything. Some people who were barely born when it first went out and so I because I was doing the quizzes I kind of watched it again to kind of find questions so I found myself watching it again and I thought yeah, actually it, it's aged really well I think yeah. it kind of even and now especially kind of with this kind of PC mentality around and how you should behave in offices and everyone's treading on eggshells and it kind of it's it, it kind of feels kind of quite original still watching it so can you tell us a little bit about the, the production of The Office, like the actual process that you went through? Because it was quite unique at the time, that real naturalistic kind of performance. Did you have the rehearsal time? Did you have the um, I, was, I was kind of, I think some of the cast did a bit of rehearsing. Um, I, I didn't, I wasn't in front of the rehearsing because I wasn't obviously one of the main parts. But um, I, I think a lot of it was just kind of the, the performance. I mean, a lot of it came from the scripts, so you didn't have to do that much. It was fairly naturalistic, obviously. And then the scripts were kind of, you know, people, the, 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 the best sort of the best compliment, I think, for a lot of the scripts were people think that it was improvised when it wasn't, you know, it was just written so well that it sounded like it could be, you know, very conversational. Um, so it was, uh, it was a fun process. It was really fun. It was, uh, kind of obviously long days like all those things are it was kind of six week shoots per series with like an extra week afterwards because most of it was obviously it helped that it was all mainly in one location so there wasn't too much you know move, unit moves or anything like that there was a there was a, a week put aside afterwards where they did all the outside shots but mainly it was uh, just filming in in the main sort of office really 
and were they like were they quite long days or was it yeah it was long days but it was um again like all these things you you kind of you get a lot of the time and then you find ways to fill it so occasionally we finish early but there was a lot of they try and do a lot of like GVs, like general shots at the end of the day. So everyone would sort of hang around because obviously the open plan nature meant that you could all, there was always a chance you'd be in the back of shot somewhere. So they'd like to have everyone there for, you know, for the whole day. How much kind of freedom were you given with the character? Um, you know, and in terms of direction as well, how were um, Ricky and Steven? Because they seem to be quite specific in how they want them. I think once you've latched on to what they want, it was it was um, it was quite easy. You know, it was quite easy because once you know what it is, it, it's not like there's a massive amount of acting to be done. You know, it's all very small. It's all very naturalistic. So, you know, I was kind of had had my thing and I kind of did it. And I don't think I was ever in any. I mean, they would always. Ricky's always uh, direction to me was to was to keep it deep. He just kind of get me before saying, go deep, go deep, and just kind of keep everything very, very still and small. Uh, but once you're in that mindset, once you know what to do, you're kind of, you're there, really. Did you, was it um, quite quick in terms of takes, like one or two takes? Or well, the main problem was Ricky back then was very much kind of off the leash in terms of, he would he would use every opportunity to try and make you corpse. So he'd be doing all sorts. So mainly, mainly the, the, the a lot of takes because Ricky was messing around, <laughs> and he kind of made it a point of pride that he could get everybody to to crack up. So he'd do all sorts of things. He'd do all sorts of drawings when it was your shot and kind of try anything he could really. So um, there were a lot of there were a lot that was you know it was with a lot of takes because it was just. It was funny, you know, and people got trouble just not laughing when a lot of it, because it's that awkward, cringe sort of humour. Yeah. It's difficult to kind of keep it together a lot of the time. So, no, it definitely wasn't straightforward in terms of quick takes. There were a lot of takes for a lot of the scenes. It sounds like you had a lot of fun. Oh, it was great fun, yeah. I mean, it was, it was, I mean, it was lucky for me in terms of, it was the first real sort of proper acting job I'd had in terms of, you know, being paid over a period of time to do acting, and then it was kind of, in a way, weirdly, it was sort of my. I, I say a lot of times to people it was sort of my sort of drama school in a way because I didn't go to drama school, but here I was, you know, for six weeks, amongst some of the great, the best British comedy actors, and just feeding off them and seeing how they did it. You know, people like Martin and Mackenzie, uh, especially. Uh, Watching them and seeing how they kind of approached it was was massively helpful for me, and I think it did stood me in good stead, you know, since then really. How did you approach it, and did you, and what you know, what did you notice about what they were doing? What kind of things did you maybe take on board? It's just the way you press, the way you kind of uh, kind of prepare, the way you sort of um, you know you don't you get into the mindset, you kind of get yourself ready to do a scene. It's kind of, but also the, I was lucky then, it's kind of the way everyone treated each other. Like there was people respected each other. There was no kind of looking down your nose at people who were thought to be, you know, down the ladder. Uh, and that, that trickles down, you know, when the people at the top are behaving like that, it's kind of, it's good to see. And it kind of, it shows you what a happy set can be like. And then going on ones that aren't so happy where there's kind of egos coming to play just makes it worse for everyone really so it was definitely good to work on a on a set that that really that worked where everyone kind of got on yeah and i pre presume you know, you worked across so many dramas with so many big names there that you must have experienced the opposite where the egos do come into play and you're kind of you know but not i've been i've been pretty lucky it's only happened a couple of times so nothing too bad really uh but I think it, you know you hear the horror stories as well, and you hear other people who work with people, and it's kind of you know I wouldn't like to be on some of those people's sets for sure. Mm.
did you did you do any kind of um, research or preparation before you went into the role, or did you do kind of approaches very much kind of instinctive and in the moment? Well, for the office, I didn't have a role when we went in. I was just one of the office workers, and it was only through being there and getting given uh, lines that were written for office worker, you know, general office workers, that I kind of almost found that character or they they kind of found it within me as we went along so the first series i didn't have a an official part it was only in series two they actually wrote up the character gave him a proper name in the scripts and everything so it was really the whole thing was pretty organic it, it was there was never kind of a moment where the character was created or anything it just kind of came into being through being in that environment mm, that's very cool that's nice that's nice yeah it was very strange but it was uh but it worked out well, you know, so I was lucky I was lucky I was in the right place at the right time, that's for yeah. sure. Where did the Scotch egg thing come into it? I can't remember you know what, when when the Scotch egg thing just came uh it wasn't in the script. I know that, because I remember because there, there wasn't even it was just a it wasn't really a character name at that point. And I, I can't remember who I think it may have been Stephen Stephen's idea. But I didn't literally didn't know it was gonna or was gonna do that until we start filming and again okay this is what we want this is what we want to happen and um it was it was that scene where where we kind of we should we struggled martin kind of struggled to to deal with it that um yes. that we kind of it became sort of this iconic thing and so then they put you know another scotch egg scene in series two and another one in uh, the christmas specials as well so again, that was one of those things that just somebody had a, probably Stephen or Ricky or somebody just literally said at breakfast, oh, why don't we, uh, why don't we bring a Scotch egg in? Because it's such a sort of, I know they've spoken about it since, it's such a sort of British thing. It's, it's kind of so associated with Britain and that kind of environment, you know, in an office break room, that it just kind of is perfect, really. And people... You know, people in like, you know, who were watching in America on BBC America didn't even, they didn't know what a Scotch egg is. No. So like, people in America go, oh, I love that scene where you're eating the apple. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it wasn't, it's sort of a slightly less healthy version of an apple, actually, but, yeah. It must have been, um, we sort of touched on it, but it's an incredible experience working with, you know, people like Martin Freeman and incredible actors yeah i mean the thing is then they weren't it's what they've gone on to be back then martin had done quite a lot already but he wasn't sort of a big name at all at the time uh similar with mckenzie it was actually you know after the office probably a lot due to the office that they went on to become the sort of the the mega stars as it were but it was great just you know, I knew who they were through the, through comedy programs and stuff. So, um, yeah, it was great working with them, definitely. Do you think that um, the the roles that you've got on to do since then are quite? Um, do you think you've been typecast? Uh, sometimes I think so, but then I think a lot of actors do get typecast one way or another. You kind of you, play, you have to play to your strengths, really. I think it's. Um, Especially, you know, if you're a character actor and you've got certain things you do, then I think that's fair enough. You know, we can't we can't all be uh, Benedict Cumberbatch, you know, and uh, and just go crazy. But uh, yeah, to an extent. But then I think I've had a couple of things recently where it's been slightly different. So I did a film that's come out this year called The Bromley Boys, where I got to do a kind of a, a more upbeat, cheerful kind of character, so that's fun as well. But I'm happy to, to kind of be typecast in those sort of roles, because at least it means you're getting cast. Yeah. If you're typecast, then at least you're cast. So you've done a lot of comedy since, haven't you? Yeah, but I was I came from a comedy background, so that was what I was interested in. Um, I've, done, I've done other sort of slightly different things. Um, but um, yeah, probably mainly, probably 90% comedy, really. You so say you have done, I mean, you've done comedy um, in theatre as well as film and television now. So, mm. what, do you have a kind of, now that you, you know, you've kind of done all these different um, roles, do you have like a process that you go through when you take on a new role now? Do you kind of honed in on, on like an ABC of how you approach a role? Do you know what? I'm kind of. 
I don't know why, maybe because of the office, but I'm really kind of open about it. And so I'm happy to kind of go where the director wants me to go and, uh, and, and take that on. So I'm, I'm always quite naturalistic about it. So I'll kind of look at it and just kind of get an idea in my head of what the character's like. And I don't go, I'm not crazy about kind of the research and all this sort of stuff. So if, they, if I get asked to do some, uh, I'm happy to do that. We used, I did a play once in the early days of the internet where we got given like homework every day to go and read about chat rooms and all this and we had pages and pages of the stuff to read and that's fine but um, personally I'm, I'm happy to be more instinctive about a script. Yeah, you need to have that flexibility don't you when you go and set? It's not that I'm locked into. Definitely, you, you've got to you've got to be flexible. You can't have everyone bend to your will. You, you've got to be creative, and you've got to be giving and kind of, you know, listening. You know, listening is a very important part of it. Yeah. Paying attention. So there's all sorts of things you can little touchstones you can it's time use. Crucial, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Do you, is that something that comes quite naturally to you? Have you kind of worked it? Do you know what I think? I, it's one of those things where it does. It, it, I thought it comes naturally, and then if, if you start thinking about it, you kind of lose it weirdly. And I think, and sometimes you lose it once you've lost it. It's really difficult to get it back. So I did a short film last year, and it's just doing the festivals at the moment. So it's just um, so I just saw it quite recently, and there's a scene in it where it was written quite late in the process. And it was kind of, it was written because because I was playing it and he wanted me to do this a little bit. And it was like, it was all about the timing. And uh, we did a quickly, did a quick rehearsal of it and it was like, great. And then I, ever since, as soon as I started filming, I just couldn't get it, I couldn't get it. And I just, he put the scene up on, <laughs> he put the scene up on Twitter yesterday. Uh, I'll go and all this scene that was written with, and he got another two other horror directors, it's like a horror film, horror comedy film. And he got these two other writers in, and they kind of created the scene. And they're, they're really happy with it. But I look at it, and I just think the timing's all wrong. And it's um, it's horrible when you when you know that when I know that I got it right when the cameras weren't rolling. But then as soon as we kept, you know, I don't. I'm, I, I like going with the director, so I occasionally, very very occasionally, I'll ask for a take for myself if I really really think that I need another take because I haven't got it. But normally, I think it's director's film; it's their project. If they're happy, great. Then that's the important thing. I'm not the important thing. But in this, I was like, part of me was going, well, you, there's no point because you're not going to get that back. But we did a few, did takes, takes after take after take, and I was. <sighs> For some reason, I was overthinking it, and I couldn't get back the timing that had made it funny. And so I was looking at it yesterday, and it's cringing because you wouldn't know if you if you didn't know, then you wouldn't you wouldn't know you wouldn't know you know you would watch it, you wouldn't know that it was wrong. Yeah. Anyone normal watching wouldn't know it's wrong. Only I know it's wrong because I can remember when it was right yeah, exactly. and why it was funny, and now it's it's still a fine scene. It's a kind of quirky little scene, but I know it should be a lot. Funnier. Right. It's just annoying when that happens. It's kind of, and it just shows there's nothing you can do about it, because you can't you can't make yourself stop thinking about it. But as soon as you start thinking about it, so it goes. It can you can lose it. So that was it's, those are like the annoying bits, um, where you've kind of got to somehow just come out of your body and just let you pass let yourself do it naturally and. Mm. That's when it works, I find. Sounds like you're quite, um, and I think this is common for a lot of actors, you are quite critical of yourself. Oh, you're definitely, I'm, yeah, I am critical of myself. Well, I am, yeah. I don't like watching myself on screen. Mm. So, definitely that's, that's, I try and avoid it where possible. Um, and again, even, you know, when, when, when you're filming and people are looking at playback, I won't. I won't watch playback unless the director asks me. Unless the director says, "I want you to do look at this and I want you to do that," then I, I don't bother because I know if I what if I look at it, I'll become self-conscious and I'll overthink. Um, so that's why, I, as long as the director's happy, then I'm happy. That's the way I look at it.
that's it. You don't want to kind of upset yourself for later takes, do you? So I can do exactly. You don't want to think about that. You want to think about what you're doing, not what you look like you're doing. Yeah. Which is why I, f I find it weird that a number of actors who do watch playback, but then everyone's different, I guess. I think everyone is different. Yeah. yeah. Everyone's different. Um, the kind of nature of um, you know, comedy, character, act, uh, performance is, you know, it's a very distinctive physical traits, isn't it? You know, the way you talk and the way you move. Like, are you, you know, is this something you think about quite a lot when you're taking on a new role? Because your role, your, your um, roles that you've done, they are very different. Again, I don't, I don't, I try not to think about it, and I try to. The script comes first, and then everything comes afterwards. That's what I, that's how I try to do it. And again, you know, a lot of it's to talking to the director and what they want, and trying to get that on the screen. That's always. I mean, I've said it before, and I'll probably I'll keep saying it. That's, that's what I want when I come into a project, especially for like, I do more TV and film because I'm not a massive fan of, of doing the theatre for whatever reason, probably some bad experiences. But, you know, for me in TV and film, it's like, director's happy, I'm happy. So that is my aim every time to give the director what they want because they're the one who's going to be sat for a month, two months in the edit, looking at you every day. And if you haven't given them someone they can work with, then it's true. the whole thing's a waste of time. So that's always my mission on any project, is to to please the director. Mm -hmm. And you find directors are a little bit different, aren't they? Absolutely, completely different, yeah. Mm -hmm. Completely different. I've been lucky, I haven't, I've never had a bad experience with the director, but I've had very different experiences. Um, where some of the, you know, the amount of detail they go into, it, it differs a lot. Yeah. Um, but it's great when 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 the, when the creative process works and the collaborative process works. It's great. I kind of wondered if you had you know more rehearsal time with comedy, um, but it doesn't sound like you do. In an ideal world, you would, but the yeah. budgets aren't there, and um, you're lucky if you get if you get rehearsal. Even on some of them, I guess on a lot of really big films, you probably do get a bit. I know you hear stories of some actors who insist on it and who will kind of wave their feet just as long as they can get rehearsal time. But, you know, it, it's tricky. I mean, occasionally you'll get a, maybe a day or something for a, for a, for a low-budget feature. But, yeah, it's, and again, in TV, schedules are so tight that there's not a lot of room for rehearsal, especially on, you know, soap operas and that sort of thing. So, um really hope for good chemistry then. Yeah, you, you, a lot of it is just, uh, I guess, in the casting process and just kind of, of knowing who you're getting in and hoping that it works. Do you still go through, because you, you're obviously very well known, you've done a lot now, do you still go through um, a lot of castings? Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm, I'm the same as anyone. I probably don't get as many castings as I'd like to get. I'd probably, I'd like to get more, but I mean, I am... I've been quite lucky in, in getting cast in things where I haven't had to go in, but then I do go to castings as well. I'm kind of, I'm the one thing, because I haven't sort of been to drama school or whatever, I, I keep saying I'm going to like pay for, because I think I've made bad auditions, because um, I'm not very comfortable in there and I know I could be better. And that's one thing I keep trying to justify, I keep saying, I keep saying I'll never do it. but. You know, I say this year will be the year I pay for some classes for, for kind of audition work, uh, because I know I could be better at it. Uh, but yeah, I go to auditions all the time. But it's interesting you say that because everybody has, all actors have their things that they they want to improve at, be better at. You know, I'm the same. Going to auditions feels slightly uncomfortable. As soon as you're on set, it's a different story. It's yeah. Um, and it's, it's, maybe it's like the stakes of the audition that you're nervous. Definitely, it's because that once you're cast, you know that they want you, so that's easy. But yeah. when you don't, when they don't want you and they don't know who you are and they're seeing all these other people as well, it's kind of what do you do? How do you impress them? But you don't want to look over keen, but you want to strike a balance. And you see all these kind of casting directors, you see their trailers for their classes about talking about going into a casting and owning the room. Uh, 
So one day I'm going to pay for one of these classes and see what owning the room means, because I don't know what it means. <laughs> but I'd love to go in and own the room. I might go and film one of these classes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good. Uh, but no, if you've got a casting director in one of these, you get a free lesson. Well, we have, actually. Yeah. yeah. We've got a different casting director, so, um, yeah, very insightful. Um, and you, you do quite a bit of writing as well. I don't do as much now. I used to do a lot of... When I started, I used, I used to do sort of sketch shows, so I'd do a bit of fair bit of writing about then. But um, we don't do the sketch stuff anymore. We sort of... We've all gone off into different areas. So I don't do as much writing now as I used to do. But I still do a little bit, yeah. Yeah. Do you think it's helpful, kind of, having that mindset when you go into, you know, your roles and being on set, kind of? It you... definitely how when, when you've written a lot of scripts, it definitely helps when you're breaking down a script and what, what you look for in a script. So it definitely, yeah, it definitely helps. And how is your kind of experience of working, and how does it differ from something like, you know, Miranda and Little Britain to The Office? So they, they must be all very different experiences if you've got, you know, different stars and different setups on each one. It's the nature of the job. I mean, you know, you, you, as soon as you understand that, you kind of... And again, things, things differ on how long you're going to be on a job. So if you're just on a job for a day, you're not too... And, and the set's a bit prickly. And you're kind of, you don't get too worried because you know you, you won't be there anymore after that day. So you can kind of deal with it. It's when you're going on a slightly longer job, if, 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 the, if there's a bit of a problem, you start worried because you're going to be there, you know, every day for a few weeks. Um, yeah, I've had a couple, I've had one badish experience where the, where the, the, I was on the film for a few weeks and, uh, Basically, the, the lead actor and one of the lead actresses just hated each other. They'd never met before, but they were just so different that it was, uh, they just hated it. It was like, it was quite funny at first, but it started to make things look <laughs> a little bit uh, toxic and prickly as we kind of went on. Um, so that's never a good thing. But, uh, you know, these things happen. You've just got to take it. It's like any walk of life. You know, if, if, if you're freelance or... Uh, you know, you do one of those jobs where you kind of work with different groups of people, then it's always the same everywhere, isn't it, I think? It is, but you hope certainly with the performers that in the casting process that there's been some kind of chemistry meet-up and, and um, I guess that maybe there's not always time to do that. I have to, I, yeah, there isn't always time. There isn't always time, especially on this job where, you know, there are a couple of egos at play, so some people just wanted to turn up on day one and without meeting anyone and, and go straight into it. So it's always a risk. Is that like one of the worst experiences you've had? You it wasn't a bad experience for me, but I think it was worse for the, it was worse for one of the actors because they just didn't know why this person had taken such a instant dislike to them. Uh, and I felt really bad for them because I didn't, I didn't know either. Yeah. It was just one of those things where I just, they, they just, uh, yeah, we've run each other up the wrong way, I guess. So, what what have you been working on recently? What's kind of next for you? Is there anything in the pipeline, or? Well, I've got the I've got the Bromley Boys, which is out now on DVD, which came out this year, which is which is good, which is I think it's on Sky as well at the moment, uh, which is a fun film where I got to play a football. F it's like about it's like a romantic comedy, but football based on a. Bromley when they were the worst team in Britain back in the late 60s. So that's a good fun film with Alan Davis and Martin McCutcheon in it. And then I've got a couple of horror films which are made but waiting to come out. So I've got Shed of the Dead, uh, which I saw, which we made a couple of years ago, but it's been stuck in post-production for about two years, which I finally saw the other week, which looks really good, looks really good. So hopefully that'll be coming out beginning of next year and another film called Foobar, uh, which again is sort of a comedy horror film. There seems to be uh, a lot there, doesn't there, comedy and horror? There is, I think uh, it's, it's kind of one of those genres that seems quite popular, especially, yeah. you know, on kind of online, on VOD, where you can make a lot of money these days for films that aren't necessarily big enough to get a, a cinema release. Mm -hmm. But there's a market there now, you know, on. Amazon and Netflix and everything for a lot of these films. And I think it's quite a popular genre. Yeah. 
So I enjoy it as well. So I'm kind of lucky that I get to do that occasionally. Have you got a kind of any advice that you would give to actors who really want to get into comedy and maybe how to approach it? Um, <clears throat> I would say it helps that if if you do, you know, the thing with comedy is there's a lot of traditional ways in that are, that are helpful, like doing live comedy. Like there's places to do it. So if you want to do stand up, or if you want to get together with, I didn't ever, I never really took to stand up, but it's, so if you want to get together with someone else, with a mate, and do sketches, there's kind of, you know, if you got to Edinburgh and do the Edinburgh Fringe just for even a week or something, if you can, if you work hard on it, you know, if you. You film like these days. When I, when I started, you couldn't really do it, but now you can film little sketches, put them up on YouTube, you know, build a following like that. Then I think that's a legitimate way into a comedy now. So, you know, a lot of people who don't can't afford to go to drama school or spend a lot on training these days, it's easy to to kind of get yourself out there, your own material out there. Yeah. So I think if you want to get into comedy acting, it really helps if you can write stuff for yourself as well. It really helps because then you can, like I say, build, build a following and have something to show cast and directors and producers and so on that you can do the writing as well as the, as well as the performing. Yeah, that's good. And the last question, what do you think makes a good comedy actor? I think there's uh, I think a good actor is a good actor. I don't see there being a difference. Again, like we said before, timing's important and timing's important in in any acting really. Yeah. I don't think there's there isn't really I wouldn't say there isn't really such a thing as comedy acting. I think there's lots of different sorts of comedy acting and there's lots of different sorts of acting and there's a lot of crossover as well. Um, so yeah, the good actors you see can do can do both, can do comedy, can do drama. Uh, so yeah, I don't think there's a real, there's a kind of a, a one characteristic or anything. Sometimes you get some actors who are, um, you know, comedy is so natural to them, and then other actors who they really, they can't do it, then you know they struggle with it. So they struggle with it, but I think if they if they got the right script in the right direction, they should. There's no reason why they should struggle with it. If they if they can act. If you can act, then you can you can do you can act in a comedy play or whatever, and mm. you should be able to do. It, I think personally, that's my. Any other any other wise words that you can offer? Well, my wise words, like we were talking about before, was um, have a have something else you can do. Don't don't think for a minute these days that acting is is sustainable as a career on its own. Um, I'm quite lucky, so I can now do I, I can now do DJing, which again I got off the back of the office because my character in the office would, would DJ the parties. So Ricky uh, Ricky Gervais actually was the one who suggested to me I should go and do some DJing on the back of that, and I can still do that. So I can do you know Christmas parties. I can I write quizzes now based on the office, so I can do that. I'm quite lucky. I get a I get occasional voiceover work, and then corporate work as well so find something you know to do find something else that you can do that's flexible uh you know i've got a friend a good friend who's an actor who's now set up his own agency as well so he's, he can do that so i'd say definitely remember that unless you're very 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 lucky uh you can be amazing and still not make a career out of it so do try and have something else that you can do as well. That's what I, that's my main advice, really. Thank you. It's all right. Thank you so much for coming. It was a pleasure to meet you. Thank you. Enjoyed it. Thank you.